morning. Uh, my name is Meredith yes, Murdoch and also Cheshire. It depends on what day I feel like, um, who I want to be that day. Murdoch is my baby name. Uh, Cheshire was my married name. So that's really my professional name. And then my legal name is Murdoch. Um, Chris and I, Dr. Cheshire, we uh, started Mulberry Integrated Medicine in 2005 in the villages. By trade, my degree on the wall prior to this is I'm a bean counter. Um, I start, started medical practices, I ran them, I sold them, um, and that's how Chris and I wound up down here because my mom decided she was gonna leave Abbeville, Long Island and come down to this place called The Villages. And we thought it was an occult because nobody <laughs> could be that happy all the time. <laughs> so we came down to visit her and um, took the golf cart ride and did all the jazz. And by the end of 4th of July weekend, actually, that's really weird. Okay, um, at the end of 4th of July weekend in 2004, we had um, secured office space up in Mulberry Grove with Dr. Abacilla. So if anybody um, is there around those times, that's where we started. So um, I guess it was around 2013. We had a patient um, that had been with us since 2005. She would come every week and she has recently um, passed her name was Dee, and she had ovarian cancer. And she went into recession, uh, recession, you felt like I was watching the stock market this morning. Um, remission three times. And one day she didn't show up, and when she didn't show up, we called the emergency rooms, we called the emergency contacts, and we couldn't get hold of her. Some of you might have heard the story before, like Lois, because I've done it before, but much more calmer than I did last time. And long story short, she decided to drink for five mils, which is a bottle about, to give you an idea, this is 10 mils, five mils of frankincense oil. Because somebody in the villages who did multi-level marketing told them that it was gonna cure her cancer. She was on tamoxifen, wound up in shans and almost died. So she came back in and started talking about it and I'm like, what, what are these little tiny bottles? And I didn't give it really any mind at that point and it moved on. Two weeks later, a woman comes in, shorts just like this woman up front. She had put lavender oil all over her legs and her legs were right reddish cherries. Did find out later that she had sensitivity to lavender oil because she used it too much and she wanted um, Chris to put acupuncture needles in it and treat it and we sent them over to get a cortisone shot. Two weeks after that, a woman comes in with her daughter. The daughter's probably in her early 30s. Put her head up like this in a ponytail. They were going to play pickleball and she put bergamot oil on the back of her neck. For those of you that don't know, bergamot oil is phototoxic. And we were watching as the blister was forming this big on the back of her neck. They came in as well to have an acupuncture needle pop the blister. We sent them over for cortisone shots and lancing. So it was at this point where I started to really pay attention because I'm Irish, things happen in threes. And I was like, what are in these bottles? So I spent $50 and I took a class from some lady in Hawaii and she sent me these tiny little bottles. And around page 70 or 80 of this booklet, I knew I was hooked. Because in there was biochemistry. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a vet. Um, I always loved the sciences, but my grandfather was the treasurer of Sony Corporation and I grew up on Fifth Avenue in New York City. So being a doctor really wasn't in, I was to be a business person a bean counter, um, finance, anything, and that's where I was really pushed to go. So at this point, this opens and my brain explodes. So from that point, I started taking classes um, secretly from my husband at the time. 
because he might be an acupuncturist, but he was also very Western. So he was like, this is this is bogus, this is this, this is bogus. Um, until his patients started getting hurt, and then he was kind of going, what's happening there? So one day I came home, and I was on our bed, and I had all this paperwork out, and he looks at me and goes, what are you doing? I'm like, no, work, going back to school. He's like, for what? That's why I'm chemistry. So I told him, and he was like, oh, wow, okay, so there is some science to this. And then I had free reign. So to date, I have over 5,000 hours in clinical aromatic training. I've worked in hospice, I've worked with vets, I've worked with some of the best hospitals on um, aromatic training down in Texas. I am the treasurer of, I guess I got to mix the two, of the Alliance of International Aromatherapists, which is basically the AMA of aromatherapy. So that is my aromatic medicine training. Somewhere in between this, I decided that this is all well and good, and I understand the chemistry, and I understand how all these oils work, but I don't understand the plant. So I decided to go back to school because I had nothing better to do, raising two children and running two businesses, to go back to school for herbalism. So I went to Heart of Herbs School, which is an AHG uh, certified school, and I also went um, back to an online school at Cornell University. And I got my degree in herbalism at that point. So now I have all these things on the wall, and um, what am I supposed to do with it? And that's when Governor Scott came in and he took away everybody's pain pills. I don't know how many of you guys remember that, where um, you used to be able to get a prescription for 30 to 60 pain pills at a time, go to Walgreens and it wasn't a problem. And then that stopped. And it needed to be done. You know, I don't really get political, but it did need to be done because there was a lot of teenagers and people abusing them and things going on on the street. But working in the villages, they did not take the villagers and this population into consideration. So what was happening is we were finding people that were coming in that could not get their pain medication that they had been on for 20 years. And they were going, one, through withdrawals, two, in pain. So Chris looked at me, he's like, can you do anything? I don't know. He's like, well, you, you just spent all this money going to school. You should be able to figure something out. <laughs> all right. So it took about six months, and the first cane cream called Caleb Propen was born, and it went to every patient. And to date, we've probably sold over, by like counting bottles and jars, over 5,000 jars of this, half of that to the villagers. Um, <clears throat> then where things started happening in the office is that pickleball um, season started again and we became the emergency room for pickleball injuries. So people would literally come into the acupuncture clinic with you know, sprained elbows, tendonitis, chin splints. So Chris is like, all right, fancy pants, why don't you make something else for you know, immediate pain relief? And that's when the second um, cream was born called Levoprofen, and that is based, and I'll go through that in a slideshow, in alpha bisabol, which is the pain reliever that is made that the German chamomile plant makes. So, any of you know oils, you know that German chamomile is one of the best oils for pain. What we do is we get the actual chemicals naturally pulled out and we put them in the cream. So, that's our analgesic cream. COVID comes and I'm starting to blow up the back office building. I have a lab back there, it's starting to get hot, patients are starting to complain because I need a temperature a certain way so I can cook a certain way, um, and it just started to get really tight in there. So we called the villages and we said, hey, I need space. And then we worked with them for a year, they had a very good relationship with the developers. And they said, okay, we're taking down Katie Bells. I guess you guys remember all this. Katie Bells has gone away, and inside of Katie Bells is going to be an open floor plan farmer's market. We want you to go in there so they wouldn't give you space. This is right before COVID. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I get brought in 
we start working, you know, there's going to be butchers, there's going to be uh, fish guys, there's going to be villages grown. This is all going to be in there. Then COVID comes. And I'm kind of like, I need to get moving, I need to get moving. And all the villages mid COVID, after COVID, they said it's COVID dead. That project is now called Sawgrass and it opens next week. So they've had this project in the works for a long time, but now that they've moved it down to Sawgrass. So Chris and I wanted this certain building in Lake Sumter because it had room for a kitchen, but it didn't need to be a commercial kitchen because I don't, um, I don't need one per se regulations. So they called me right after. Um, they told me that the project was dead. And they said, oh, by the way, that building you want is open now. Oh. So within, I don't know, 24 hours, we signed the lease. And that is when the modern apothecary was born. So what I'm going to do today is go through what is a modern apothecary. What did we build here for the villagers? And this is not new. It might be new to the villages, but you're going to start seeing, when you start traveling, you're going to start seeing these pop up more and more until we get shut down, which is a whole other story. But because after COVID, people are really interested in what our earth can give us. It's not just new age cuckoo anymore. Now people are starting to really understand that Everything we need to heal ourselves is in here. You just have to know how to use it. So here are some quick facts to kind of give you an idea of the growth of this industry. Aromatherapy in 2017 was a 4.429.8 million dollar industry. 2028 is projected to be 1.6 billion. Herbal medicine 2019 was 83 billion. 2030 projected to be 550 billion. So you can see how these numbers are jumping and they're jumping fast. Big Pharma, to give you an idea, 1.11 trillion in 2018. So you can see this is not, this is going faster and faster and bigger and bigger every year. There are two top designations in this industry and this is important for you guys to know when you leave the villages and you find yourself you know, in Kansas or in California or New York or North Carolina and you decide you need something. You want to find people like myself who know what they're talking about. Because we are not regulated by the state, it is very hard to understand what people's education levels are. So that is one big thing today I want to um, educate you on it is who does what. One is an RA and one is an RH. Think of registered nurses, that's where it came from. The RA and RH designation is a registered aromatherapist and a registered herbalist. Both of those exams were built by clinical registered nurses groups. So the holistic nurses of America or whatever that group is, they create our exams. So it's the nursing community that really we work under. Um, you have to understand if commitment and education involved if any of you are nurses or know nurses, you know that they're no joke and their education is no joke. Um, to attain either one of these, you have to have over 500 to 700 hours, 700 hours of education, case studies and clinicals, and write, if not more than one, at least one research paper. I did my research paper on aromatics and um, Alzheimer's. Uh, we cannot diagnose, you're gonna find that because with acupuncturists too, um, and a lot of lower level healthcare practitioners, we cannot diagnose, we can only treat. Uh, we can suggest what research has been found effective in your diagnosis. We are not permitted to take you off medications and I will never tell you to go off the medications and any one of us that tells you to do that, um, run for the hills. 35,000 to 70,000 plant species have been researched for pharmaceutical uses. Up to 50% approved drugs on the market come from natural products which then are kept in the formula or synthesized. How many people know white willow bark? Okay, white willow bark is aspirin. So your Bayer aspirin is 90% plant material. Big Pharma has contributed to indigenous medicines and plants going to extinction in order to create their patents. So that is um, something I've recently 
really started getting pretty passionate about because there's a lot of really cool plans in other places besides here. And sometimes our American companies go over and we wipe out um, whole communities, actually. And we wipe out forests just so we can get a new medicine onto the FDA docket. It's called biopiracy, real concern right now. So when you do own a modern apothecary, you do need to pay attention to those things. Because if I know that there's a plant that's going to go into extinction soon, and you come in and you want it just because it smells good, I'm not going to sell it to you. And I'm sorry that way, I'm sorry. Because we have to protect what we have right now. Um, we are taught that the whole plant is to be recognized and not just one certain chemical constituent, which is basically the difference between how we look at medicine and how um, a pharmacist looks at medicine. We are also trained in the doctrine of signatures. So very simply, the doctrine of signatures is when you cut a tomato in half, it looks like a heart. When you eat a walnut, it looks like a brain. Yet, so you start looking at these foods and why are they good for that? It's the earth giving us clues to what it's producing things for. So a sample of the chamomile plant. Everyone knows chamomile, whether you know the oils as Roman and German, uh, cape, blue may, or just the regular herb that you drink in your tea. So these are the chemical constituents, schmulazine, alpha bisabol, regular bisabol oxide, metricacin, uh, quercerin, and all these are in the plant. And then the essential oil, this pharmacine, alpha bisabol, uh, methamyl angelate, that's gonna be in your Roman chamomile, and isomyl angelate, which is also gonna be in your Roman chamomile. All of this comes out of one plant. What's used by pharma, alpha bisabol. So you can see what you can get out of one plant is pretty incredible. When you're looking at essential oils, as an essential oil clinical person, I don't look at the smells, I look at these. So I blend and I treat from a chemical standpoint. So as aromatherapists, we need to know over 90 different chemical constituents. So if you turn around and you tell me that you have knee pain and shoulder pain and tendonitis, I'm gonna look at beta carolopoline and alpha pinene and see which oils are highest in those. And that's how I'm going to treat you, not just because something smells good. That comes later. Functional herbalism, holism, and medicine. So I was fortunate enough um, from 2008 to 2018, 19, 18, 18. Um, Dr. Douglas Hall, he was, um, one of the biggest functional medicine doctors in the area. He worked in our office, brilliant man. Um, unfortunately, he did have two strokes and he's in Ocala um, recovering. But I was able to be his medical assistant and learn the ins and outs of functional medicine for 10 years, which has definitely helped me along the way here. Uh, functional medicine, any of it is treating the whole person, taking into account mental and social factors rather than just physical symptoms of a disease. So if you come in and you tell me you have constant headaches, they're not migraines, they're not cluster headaches, and you can't get rid of them, I'm not gonna treat your headache. I'm gonna ask you what's going on, why are you getting those headaches? More than likely, there's something going on in here or in here that's causing those headaches. An example is, and this is a true story, I had a client come in, this exact problem, turns out she hadn't talked to her son in 20 years and her son just called her out of the blue. And from the moment her son called, she had a headache, then we stopped. So does she have a headache because she has a physical symptom? No, the physical symptom came from an emotional response. So functional herbalism, functional medicine, and what we do, we look at the whole thing. So we're not just looking at why you have a headache. We're going, okay, why are you getting the headaches with your son? Are you nervous? Oh yeah, I'm nervous. I'm thinking back to you know what broke us down 20 years ago. I'm not sleeping. I'm not this. So we treat the underlying cause, not just the headache. We determine how and why illness occurs and restores health by addressing the root causes for each individual 
and in our store, we're going to take that all into consideration. So we're not just going to say, here, smell this oil, this is going to be great. We're going to give you a whole package of information for you to make your own choices based on what is going on with you. What is in a modern apothecary? Essential oils. Um, my essential oils, we don't, I don't do doTERRA. Um, I don't do Young Living. I don't do any multi-level marketing. The retail oils that you get, you're the fourth person to touch them. So um, Aromatics, that company that I use, it goes from the place of origination, India, Madagascar, to Montana. Montana processes it, bottles it, sends it to me, and it goes to you. So that's why my bottle of an oil is going to be $8, and a um, other essential oil companies, especially in the multi level marketing, is going to be $15 to $20. Recently, I, um, joining AIA, I had to, part of my contract is I had to join LinkedIn, it's a social media site for professionals. I don't do a lot of that, but, and I got this message from this guy, and his name was Ian, and he was from Jacksonville, and I thought, well, this is cool, because he's a distiller. Ian wasn't just a distiller, Ian's wife's family owns most of the farms in Europe, Africa, and India of essential oils. And what had happened was Ian's daughter wanted to move to the U.S., so they opened up their U.S. operations in Jacksonville. So now, even though I have these retail oils, I have a private stash that I get straight from South Africa, and I have learned that essential oils are mar marked up almost, I, 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 when I got these prices, I just nearly beat my hands, 9,000%. Um, so for me, this 10 ml bottle of oil, you might turn around and buy, um, I don't know, $40 maybe. Yeah, if this is tea tree oil in here, 13 cents. So I started purchasing directly from South Africa. The great part is I get these amazing oils that are non-adulterated, they smell fabulous. Um, we are selling them in the store, and if you join a, a special part of the website, we call them Fave Naked Oils, because I try to give you the price as close to that I can give you, um, but we don't do anything fancy. We give you the GCMS reports, but we do not um, put fancy labels or do any of that. We just give you the oils, hence the naked oils, because people have been coming into the store complaining that things are getting so expensive, and they don't have to be, but I mean, I have the same tea tree oil that Butera does. We buy from the same people now, except I'm getting it straight from the same way Butera does. There's no middleman. So you do have to be careful where you purchase your oils. Now, Butera does have good oils. I just don't agree with their business practices. Um, Young Living has been proven time and time again to have adulterated oils. And if you want to know what that is, you can take a chemistry course that I teach to explain that. But the number one um, question I get in here is how do I know what a good essential oil is and what it's not? And a simple question is the Latin binomial. So if you pick up an essential oil bottle and it says <coughs> lavender oil and that's it, more than likely it's fragrance. If you pick it up and it says lavendula aquasfolia, lavender oil, that's a real oil because legally that's what it has to be. So. Um, you want to be careful when you purchase your oils. Same thing with herbs. You don't have to buy all your oils organic. Um, you want to buy your citrus oils organic because of the way um, they're cold pressed. So think of huge, huge panini maker just squishing them. So if there are pesticides on the rinds, that's going to come into the oil. Um, other oils like vetiver and your root oils, you don't have to worry about so much. However, with herbs, you want to make sure you always use organic all the time. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, so essential oils, we have 25 uh, different in the line. Um, our employees, I train them and I send them to school. So that way I can continue to build the companies 
and not have to worry that um, I, my girls are giving out that information. Herbs. Uh, we have now 155 raw herbs, I think. Uh, we just keep getting more every time we're like, we need more mason jars. Um, it's a little bit of an addiction. Um, so we'll all have dried herbs in our, um, some of us will have powders. I don't like working with powders because most of the time powders then need to go into pills. I don't like manufacturing those, especially in the state of Florida. They really, um, I don't want to pay the money or aggravation to have the state in my business that way. Um, so what I do have because of the uh, medical practice, I have a pharmaceutical line of supplements instead. So if I want a uh, powder go to cola, I'm going to find a, a pharmaceutical grade company that makes that. I'll just bring those bottles in and let somebody else deal with the legalities part. Um, so we'll have herbs, powders, supplements. We'll also have tinctures. I make all the tinctures in-house. My favorite way as an herbalist to make a tincture is the old-fashioned way of taking vodka, plants, and putting them in the sun for six weeks and shaking them up. Um, we can't do that much anymore because when people come in and they want tinctures, they want them now, but they don't want to wait six weeks. So we bought a tincture machine, which I didn't, I have to thank the uh, legalization of marijuana for that because <laughs> the legalization of marijuana has brought a whole new realm of uh, different type of equipment to herbalists that weren't normally there, like tincture machines. Herbalists didn't have tincture machines until the marijuana movement came through, and now there's plenty of them. So now we can make quick tinctures. So if you come in and you say, I have high cholesterol and I want a butterfly tincture, we can make it for you in three hours. As we uh, We do do private consults. Um, I only really, when I do a private consult with someone, um, I tend to go in depth because in our we need to know how to read blood work. So I'll ask for your most recent blood work. I'll ask for MRIs if you're in or CTs if you're dealing with pain. Um, so we need to have a large understanding of pharmacology. And we also need to know um, pretty much everything a, a registered nurse needs to know. Other natural products you'll find in the modern or pocket there are syrup, ciders, honey, cooking herbs, specialty items. Those are going to be your custom formulations. Like right now, I have a man that's going through chemo, and we're making him a mushroom and milk thistle tincture. And they've now reordered it three times, and he's getting his energy back. So that's really uh, cool. So we'll do a lot of custom formulations. Sometimes we'll help you customize your own. Other times, we're literally just like Wolverines. Like you come in and you say, I know what I want. I want this, 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 and this and we get you. We have mind, body, mind, and spirit. We have some metaphysical items, cleansing products, crystals, books. We try to keep everybody in the middle just happy. Um, <coughs> the crystals were the newest one. Um, everyone wanted me to carry crystals, and I couldn't find um, really a company that I liked. And then I found a company at Importer out of New Jersey, and I got all excited you have to be invited to buy them. That's how snotty they are. So I got invited, so now we have them. But it took almost a year of me being invited to actually get them. Uh, some quick research that's relevant right now on essential oils. Uh, lemon and geranium for COVID. I was telling some of the women earlier before about Three weeks ago, um, I got COVID and was not fine. And I, I figured I was just going to pass all through. Ironically, I got COVID, and for three weeks prior to that, I wasn't in the store quite a bit because I was running around with my kids. Because we always make the joke, we're never going to get sick because we work in the healthiest place in the planet. Because we're constantly around these things. So I geared myself up, drank, I don't know, more pots of tea than you can even imagine. Um, I had the diffusers running, and I kicked COVID in three days. I went from faint line to dark, dark, oh crap, dark line to no line. 
three days. Lemon and geranium, um, these are all in PubMed. So if you want to find any relevant research, any good person that does what I do, they're going to go through PubMed, which is the National Institute of Health, to get their research. Um, lemon and geranium with COVID, those two together kill the spike protein envelope. So if you get COVID or you're exposed to COVID, those two oils together, and it's the chemicals, it's probably, my guess, it's geranium and it lime and you mix together, uh, break that envelope so the, um, they can't, the cells can't multiply. Study came out, peppermint, eucalyptus, and orange for taste and smell. So people that have lost their taste and smell in COVID, the first study came out, showed it did a inhaler blend of peppermint, eucalyptus, and orange. Um, someone else, now these are not peer reviewed because there haven't been time, enough time to do peer review. So what has happened with this one here in particular, the peppermint, eucalyptus, and orange, people have also added clove and tea tree to that. And anecdotally, that's working faster than that. Um, I can't exactly tell you why, which chemicals are making it work, but we'll get to it. Um, not the oils, but the chemistry. Menthol, one eight cineol, that seems to be, but then you have your D-limonene. So all of those could be parts of it. And we're not really gonna know the answer until more people keep doing research. Most of that research is coming out of China and Korea and India. It's not coming out of the US. Um, how the body responds through essential oils through inhalation. Um, essential oils can go through the blood brain barrier. So that's why it can get into your bloodstream. Relevant research on herbal medicine. This is one of my favorite stories. Licorice, licorice is great. The thing with licorice is you gotta be careful that you can't take it all the time because you'll get stomach upset. And the irony of that is people might have done this before, could raise their well, I take licorice every day for my stomach upset. Right, because of the glycerinic acid, which we'll get back to the frankincense. The glycerinic acid in licorice is what is helping kill COVID. It also rips your stomach apart. So the licorice that you take after the fact, the glycerinic acid has been taken out. Wormwood. So as I said earlier, everything happens in my world in threes. So one day a woman walks in, do you have wormwood? Yeah, why? Wormwood's an antiparasitic. It kills COVID. Really? No, we don't have it. Rachel and I look at each other. Happens three more times. We're like, what is and within like days? Like I'm talking three days, maybe even two days. Yeah, wormwood, yeah, wormwood. So finally I go to PubMed, sure enough, there's a study on wormwood that does help heal COVID. The study, however, and this kind of shows you when you read things, you need to go back to the source. Because Healthline or whatever these people were reading, Dr. Oz said, oh, wormwood, there's COVID. No, the chemical constituent that has been taken out and then synthesized and now put in an IV, which is what the study actually was, is what here. So what we did was at that point, we took copies of the study and for the next week when people came in, do you have wormwood? We hand out the study and said, okay, listen. So then they did another study and we were about six months later and then wormwood with slippery elm and mugwort, I believe. Those three together in an infusion, AKA tea, did actually, but you had to have the other two and they did help kill the COVID cells. Um, there's 43 herbs in the database for COVID-19. Again, you can go to PubMed and you can look. Um, and obviously COVID-19 is still around. You know, I don't know if we're gonna call it COVID-22 um, or the Rona, but anything that you're really looking for. So if you're looking for herbs that are heart healthy, go to PubMed, put herbal medicine for cholesterol and put them all these studies come up. And if you think, this is the one thing I get from people all the time, well, I don't know how to re research studies. I'm not a researcher. I don't pretend to be, I'm friends with them. They're very interesting people, and I don't want to be in their groups because they just talk way too much science for me. 
At the end of the day, if you're looking for answers, just go to the conclusion. So it's going to be 45 pages of diagrams and all of charts and this and that and timings. Go to the conclusion. You'll find your answers there. So, oh, this is an interesting title. 45 pages down, this is the conclusion. Chloroform is good for being proven great for heart issues. Okay, I'm going to take chloroform. It takes you three minutes. Uh, final talking point before I go into any questions. Um, how to find us. These are the two big aromatic companies and the herbal company. So if you are somewhere and you're trying to find one of us, and we're not going to be all over Facebook and things like that, is you're going to look under AIA, NAHA, which is the National Association of Holistic Aromatherapy, or the AHG, which is the American Herbalist Guild. I am an RA, I am not an RH, because um, you really have to pick one at my age. I'd still be in school, and I'm going to be 50 and I'm on this one. So um, I've, I've had enough, but there are a lot of younger kids coming in, which is really interesting. Um, probably in the past two months, I've had high schoolers come in and interview me about what I do. It's the first time, and it's not just here, we're, we're talking about nationwide. There's kids coming out of high school going, wanting to come straight out into alternative medicine. That's never happened before. So the colleges are starting to, like the American College of Healthcare Sciences, it is the first time this year that they have more students under the age of 30 than they ever had before. Most of the average students usually like myself, they go back to school at 35, 38 years old. So now they're getting 20 year old students. So this is moving forward at a rapid pace. Uh, what truly is our education? I kind of went through that. We basically need to do everything that a PA and under needs to do or an RN. So we need to know pathophysiology. We need to know um, pharmacokinetics. We need to know chemistry, organic and biotic. Um, Sorry. Sales for memberships and professional organizations. So we don't have health care licenses. So I work under my ex-husband's license. I'm very fortunate to be able to do that um, because I am an herbalist and I am a certified herbalist and a master herbalist. And I have that education. Under his malpractice laws, I can work under him. So I have a lot more freedom than most people do. Um, and I'm very fortunate for that. However, most people aren't that fortunate. So if you are not that fortunate, you are going to join one of these guilds. Because in order for you to get that membership certificate, you have to prove to the office staff what your education is. And if you don't have an education, you don't get that. So when you look at someone's website, you're going to want to look and see if there's any professional organizations on there because it's not a, these organizations aren't, let's just drop a check and we give you a membership. They actually really do ask for things. Um, once you go through, like <coughs> on NAHA, I had to send documents to get that, a level three certified. I had to send like that many sets of documents, case studies, this and that. Now that I sent it, it's on auto renew and nobody talks to me and I just keep getting my thing. But in the beginning, you have to go through all this. Um, we are not salespeople. Our job is to educate. We have to, um, on any of these organizations, our first job is to educate. That's why I come up here and I do these things. I do get, I was telling Mary, whether there's one of you or 400 of you, I still get one CE credit. And I need to do 40 CE credits every two years. So every time I do one of these, I write Mary's name down, put her phone number down, and say, I did this on this day, you can call and ask her. So that's why I do this, because my job is to educate. That's also why they leave me in the back, because as my one assistant, Rachel, would say, if we let her in the front all the time, we'd have to shut the doors, because I give everything away for free. Um, I'm like, no, you really don't need that. She's looking at me like, really? Which we're working with some things. But no, really, we're not, um, we're not salespeople. I'm not gonna try to sell you an oil 
Um, which goes back to ingestion. Please don't ingest any oils. That's a whole other topic for another time that I can talk about. Um, and this is the reason why. So if I turn around to you and say, Mary comes up to me and she says, I really want some lemon oil for energy, okay? I'm gonna sell her a bottle of lemon oil. It's gonna cost her $10. What happens after that? Multi-level marketer is gonna turn around and tell you to start putting it in your drinks and putting it under your tongue. Why? Because they need to sell you another bottle of oil. I'm gonna tell Mary to open it up snip it a few times or put it in an inhaler or, and if that's all she does, she's gonna have it for four years. So we're not in it for the money because that's not, um, that's not what we do. <coughs> we do have over 330 essential oils um, in the building. Some of them are locked up for you. <laughs> for some of you who know essential oils, I walked in one day and Rachel, my head assistant, Bless her heart, as they say in the South. I let them play a lot. She's making me sad. Big eight ounces. And I'm watching her pour Kelly Christmas in like this. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, that was um, $350 for the oil right there. She learned her lesson on that one real fast. So we have all those rare oils. We have special oils. We have sandalwood with Palo Alto. We have spike nerve. You're just not going to see them up front. If, if you want any special oils, you can let me know and I know how to get them. I can't promise I'm going to get them overnight. Like we just picked up an oil called Lipia japonica from South Africa. Works very much like a spruce with the respiratory system. Um, it took me um, nine weeks to get it. It shipped over, but we can um, we can do all those things. Um, so we're always educated. The other thing that we have is we have classes because sometimes people don't want to do consults, but they want to learn more. And we can't necessarily sit in a store for two hours and teach you everything you need to know about the top 10 herbs for your cardiovascular system. So instead we have classes. Um, we run them quarterly. So that means every season they come out for three months we have everything from soap making, um, which is the most popular class, to you know herbal deep dyes for the endocrine system, which is not always one of the most popular classes. But for someone who has Hashimoto's, you know that is a good way for them to learn what's going on with their body in more of a classroom setting to learn what they need to do. Again, this is part of our job is to educate. Questions. We're um, Lake Sumter Landing between uh, BKI and the Chop House, across the street from Sherman Williams. Across the street from what? Sherman Williams. Okay. The top. With that? The oh, thank you. Yeah, we um, we worked really hard putting it together, trying to, um, especially with the blending bar and things like that, putting that together so it's an interactive experience. Um, in the store, we do have a blending bar where we have 20, 36. We have 36 oils that you can mix together on your own. You can put them in shampoos, conditioners, uh, diffuser blends, roller balls, uh, bath salts. And then also there, back to the education, we have a wall of, I spent a few months researching the most common conditions in the villages. I'm very fortunate that I do own medical practice as well because I can go into the database. What are our biggest codes that we build to the insurance company? Okay, well, that means these are the biggest problems in the villages. So I took that information, went to PubMed, found all the oils that have been clinically tried for those conditions. So we have little business cards that will say muscle skeletal issues or fungal issues or respiratory issues that you can come and take for free knowing that we've already done the science for you. So you can say, okay, I have um, bronchitis, you know, or I'm prone to bronchitis. Okay, I'm gonna get these five oils because I know she's already done the work that they're clinically tested for bronchitis. So would you sniff them? It depends on um, what the condition is for. So respiratory, you're gonna do mainly inhalation. 
The only time um, I have not done inhalation for respiratory, and I was going to try it with COVID, but I just didn't have the materials at the time. Um, is I got the flu maybe four years ago, and I did a suppository. And I got rid of the flu in like um, four days. Even uh, Glenn, Glenn was like, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, I, I, I'm going to send people over to you to do that. That's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I do work with some of the healthcare providers in the area. Um, I have a love-hate relationship, or they have a love-hate relationship with me as a dermatologist. Um, because I can seem to get rid of some of the things on skin faster than they can. And we work right behind, um, our medical practice is right behind, uh, what do they call themselves now? It's in Lake Sumter Landing. Um, you'll see a big sign that says dermatology. Anyway, there's a PA there named Cy, and he came over a few weeks ago. He was like, what are you doing to my patients? And I'm like, I don't know what you're going to do to your patients. He's like, I'm giving them this, this, and they go, and it's not working. And then they're coming here. He's like, yeah, but no, literally, what are you doing? So I went and I showed him everything. He's like, this is the shit. He's like, yeah, you test this in school. And it's all just plant-based material. So we do work with a lot of different um, healthcare practitioners, only because we work in science. You're not going to find a lot of um, crazy voodoo at our store. Yeah? Number one. Um, Number one, I with cholesterol, I would look into a Horton tincture. Horton, H A W T H O R N tincture. I think it's um, one of the cardiologists at Citrus. I think has been sending people over to do that. Yeah, Carl. What actually is a tincture? I've heard it before. Okay, How is so it different? A tincture is. I don't have one with me, but I do have a tea. So. If you take some of this herb and you put it in hot water, you're going to have a tea and you're going to drink it. And you're going to get, you know, some benefits out of it. What a tincture is, we're going to take this much herb, we're going to put it in a tincture machine or even in a mason jar, you're going to do it the old fashioned way. You're going to put vodka in it and you're going to let it sit. And the heat pulls all the medicine out of the plant. So the plant is basically shot by the time it's done. And now all of that, the reaction with either glycerin or alcohol makes a tincture. So 30 drops of a tincture is going to be equal to this whole bag, if you were to drink this whole bag tea-wise. Very, very strong interaction. Yep. Put it under your tongue if you can handle it. Um, they don't taste very good. There's just no way to make them taste good. But they are um, our number one best-selling product besides the pain cream is actually called Deep Rest Tincture, and it's all the herbs for sleep. And you put that under your tongue about a half hour before you go to bed. Um, the only thing we tell you is to make sure you don't drink alcohol with it or take any you know, Valium or anything like that because um, or Xanax because it could have an effect. You know that's the other thing that we do in the store is that. Some items we will not sell to you until we know what you're taking, just for malpractice purposes. So if you come in to our store, you'll see the tincture for St. John's Ward is empty on our shelf. And you're gonna look at it, you're gonna go up to one of us. I'd like to buy this, but if the bottle is empty. Are you on any antidepressants? Yes, but well, we can't sell it to you. Because I'm not going to um, hurt my license for that because what happens is you take St. John's Ward and you're on Lexapro, Wellbutrin, Sertraline, any of those, you can go to a serotonin syndrome and you can seizure out and die. So that seems pretty um, silly reason to take an herb. Um, but if you're not on anything, then we say, okay, that's fine. And we'll, well, and we've had people get mad at us before. Well, I'll go to the vitamin shop. Go to the vitamin shop. But the thing is, at the vitamin shop, you're getting like not much St. John's Ward in like one tiny little pill, where 30 drops, you're getting like the whole bottle that you would be getting from the vitamin shop. So we're very, very careful about those things, especially in teachers. Yeah? What about people who have allergies? How would you test to find out they're not going to have a reaction? With the herbs and the oils, you'll know right away. It's actually pretty cool. Your body will, so say here at the blending bar, we have these uh, testing strips, 
right? These perfume things that you get at Macy's and whatnot. You won't put the oil on it. The minute we come near you, if you're gonna have an allergy to it, you'll be like, no. It's really, it's really quite interesting. You'll know right away. You won't even have to sneeze or anything like that. Your body will just know, I don't want to hear this. Pretty, this happens, it happens all the time. Yeah. Same thing with the herb to start. If you let you smell the herbs, your body will automatically, because everything is so pure, your body knows right away. It's not something like, say you're allergic to chamomile. If you go and smell a tea bag from Publix and sleepy time tea, you're not gonna have that reaction because you've been processed so much. When we give you real chamomile, and you're allergic to it, you're gonna go, like, like you already feel like, you know, everything's starting to close up, and everything like that. So your body actually already knows. P-U-B-M-E-D. Yep. You can just Google PubMed. I think it's not Yeah. What's the difference between the ingesting and the ingesting? Well, the ingesting, for one, um, you're dealing with extremely, in oils, you're dealing with extremely um, concentrated chemical extracts. I had a woman... Um, and it's very dangerous. Uh, people don't seem to know that. And it's not just the woman who drank the frankincense. Um, yeah, they, the interesting part about frankincense, if anybody wants to know, is that the whole thing is a farce with frankincense and cancer. Um, the frankincense boswellia carteri tree produces something called boswellic acid. Boswellic acid is what's been tested in cancer research, and it is starting to work, go into clinical studies for chemo drugs, boswellic acid. This part is true. What is not true is that when you distill the resin of the frankincense to get the oil, all the boswellic acid is distilled out, so it is not in the oil. So does frankincense possibly cure cancer? Possibly, yes. Does frankincense oil? No, because the constituent that's doing it has been taken out during the distillation process. Nobody adds that part to it. Um, so back to the ingestion is when you get home or, I mean, you can just take this plastic cup. I don't have everything that I have right now I think is cut and diluted, but you can take your lemon oil, put it in a plastic cup, watch it burn through. Oh, yeah. And so if you can burn through that, what is it doing to your stomach like? But no, no, let's take more. So I have a client and she was in one of these groups once and I looked at her and she's like, honey, you can use my name all the time. Uh, she's like, I don't care that I'm an idiot. She's really funny, her name's Michelle. Michelle comes to me and she's uh, first time in the store. She's at the blending bar. She says, what do you have for kidney, kidney and liver? Like, I wouldn't do anything with the oils or kidney and liver. I would go with the herbs. Oh, I said, do you need any help? No, I'm just looking. So then she comes back. Are you sure? Like, yeah, I'm sure. Well, wouldn't you drink them? Like, no, no, you wouldn't, especially for your liver and kidney. Trip. So then she walks around, and I go in the back and come back. So let me ask you that question. I really want oils for my liver. And I said, there is no scientific evidence that you just need for treating any oils, even topically, for your liver kidneys actually even exist. Well, I take oils all the time. For the past 15 years, I have drank lemon oil in my morning, and then I have put peppermint oil in my Diet Coke for 15 years. And now I'm in liver and kidney failure, and I need new oils. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> and I'm like, girl, really? I said, what, what, what is it from? Oh, they don't know. They don't know why. So I went out and I got a styrofoam cup. And you know, some of my um, colleagues will be like, you know, that's a party trick. But I mean, it shows the general public what oils can do without going into the deep science of chemistry. Nobody wants to sit here and listen to me talk for 45 minutes on, you know, what happens in the chemical reaction between this and this, and that's why you can't, it's boring. 
it finished. So I take a styrofoam cup and I put oils in it and you watch as it goes and it disappears. So I show her my party trick, she's like, ooh, what's that doing in the middle of your kidneys? There you go. Mm -hmm. She's like, I guess I need some herbs. I go, I think you need to go talk to your doctor. <laughs> so she left. She comes back, I don't know, a few weeks later. And um, she actually thanked me for pushing her to tell her doctor what was going on because they did not understand why her ASD and ALT levels were so high. It's because she was drinking the oils all the time and her liver and her kidneys were starting to fail. So they're starting to reverse it now. There was a, I think it's um, S-acetylglutathione and N-acetylcysteine that they found, her, her doctor actually found a study that can start reversing the damage from essential oil damage with those um, vitamins. I think it's But yeah, so, it's, no, she, so she does that. She takes a tincture, she does a tea, and her numbers are coming down. But for 15 years, this is what she did. And people just don't, you know, think anything of it. If you know it's going to burn a hole in a cup, why would you want to ingest it? Now, so I will always say inhalation and topically. And when you do it topically, you also want to dilute it because what happens with happened with the woman with the red and um, the red legs is she had used lavender oil so long neat, meaning undiluted, that she got an allergy to it. So anywhere, if she goes into Walgreens and she smells Johnson & Johnson, she'll break out in hives. So you do really have to be careful. These are these are really powerful little drops of you know, plant power in there. Um, I would be remiss to say that I went through all this education and say, don't ingest them. There is a time and place. Can you ingest them? Yes. Is there a time and place for it? Yes, like when I had the flu. I made a suppository. I have never, um, the only time I've actually ingested an essential oil is when I was experimenting. I wasn't, um, wasn't sick. I was playing with it, but um, it was a class. And what they did was they had you take dried herbs, granola, like a whole, it made kind of like an energy cube and put one drop in there. And basically the food was doing the breakdown of going through the digestive tract. And again, that was for, you know, when you're sick, it's not for something to do all the time. Yeah. And the infusion, did you put an infusion, it's gonna be detrimental. Yes and no. Um, the big thing is that everyone thinks that tea tree is great for dogs. Tea tree can actually kill dogs. Um, I took a 200 hour course, I'm not done with it yet, but I got I got the book, which is really what I paid for. Um, we had a lot of people come in and sort of questions about their animals and essential oils, and I just didn't know enough, so I did take a class on that. Um, Carmen's not here. Lois is in her group that she runs, a woman named Carmen, brought her dogs to me. And we did, um, I did a whole bunch of case studies on dogs, and it's really kind of cool because what you did was you took, we took like marjoram, lavender, orange, lemon, we put them on the scent sticks, and we put them all over the store, and we walked the dog to them. And the dogs could pick out which ones they liked and they didn't like. And it would vary between the dogs. It wasn't when they all liked this, they all liked that. Now one of, I think it was Carmen's dog, went into, the, we have this tiny little room, I call it the uh, Van Shopping Cave, and uh, there was this little Lhasa Hapso in there, and it was art, and he's laying on his back, like, <laughs> I'm living the life. So she ended up buying um, a hydrosol, which is the essential oil, this, the water from the distillation of an orange, and an orange essential oil, and she uses it on the dog during firework time, and it calms him down. But the dog told us what it liked. Now, if you diffuse it in the house, I can tell you when I was sick, when COVID had the diffusers all over the place, I had a schnauzer and a Bichon. The Bichon would stay, the schnauzer was like, no way. Like, the schnauzer just kept her distance, she didn't like it. Um, I don't really think it's a very wise move to diffuse around cats. Their system is completely different. Essential oil and cats are just a big no-no. Um, the one thing that cats have that dogs don't have is their ability to jump. So if you have something in your kitchen, the cat doesn't like it, it will go high. So most of the time the animals will work around it. 
but you really don't want to put any oil on them, and especially not heat your food. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so the orange helps calm the dog. In this case, yeah, it wouldn't be where I would want it. Matter where you put it on the dog. What we, what I tell people to do is get a dish rag, uh -huh. like a piece of a dish rag, you know, slight, or an old T-shirt. Put the oil on the T-shirt and tie it on the collar. Oh, okay. So that way it's not on. Just a couple drops of oil. Yeah. Okay. And that way it will calm the dog, and then you have control because you don't want them to have it for too long. Right. So like ten minutes is fine. They don't. Their scent receptors that are so much larger than ours are. Um, if there's something more, that's where I really like the pets and the hydrosols, where you can spray that on their beds. Um, and we have scent memory. So just like you know, Pavlov's dog, we have scent memory. So what will happen um, with animals is like you start using a lavender or hydrosol when um, fireworks are coming, they'll start to recognize hum or Whenever you leave the house, if they have anxiety, you spray that on you and on them, and they start to recognize that smell as, oh, mommy's coming back. So it is really cool what you can do with animals, as long as you just do it safely. Any other questions? Lily? Yeah. Um, can you talk about the last time I moved? Lois runs the oh, oh, street room and her we had to put it off, I think, once or something. Like it, it, it was difficult to schedule it, so we finally got it scheduled, and my flight was canceled. I literally flew to the rec center from the airport. My hair was all over the place. I hadn't had coffee. I'm like, I'm here. I'm doing it. I had no presentation. Was it was a, I, I was completely lost. She says I'm not. Wasn't, but I was. I think I was. So thank you very much, and happy Fourth of July. Thank you.